just making money. So we started talking about coffee and uh, I think I coined the phrase, I just said, oh, that's just coffee how it should be. So, you know, you buy your coffee and most of the money goes to the people that grow it. And um, isn't that how it should be? Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering you, dear listener, a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash midlife. The link is in the show notes so you can get started listening today to an audiobook that will help you turn your entrepreneurial ideas into reality. Hello fellow midlife entrepreneurs. This is Kevin Boyd, business coach, entrepreneur and all-round psychology nerd, bringing you interviews with people on the same entrepreneurial journey as yourself, hoping to inspire you to change your thinking, take action and bring your vision to the world. In this episode of the Midlife Entrepreneurs Podcast, we meet Ruth Anslow, who quit her corporate job to take on the UK supermarkets and change how they treat their suppliers and to give customers a healthier and more ethical choice of products. I was inspired by Ruth's conviction and persistence at achieving her goals, and I hope you are too. It's uh, season three, episode three of the Midlife Entrepreneurs Podcast, Mm -hmm. and today we're with uh, Ruth Anslow, who uh, is the founder of Hispy, um, How It Should Be, Mm -hmm. which is a supermarket that uh, is trying to revolutionize and change the way supermarkets work. Mm -hmm. So welcome to the show. Thank you. So I'm curious, how did this whole idea come about? I suppose we got pissed off with Tesco. Um, So, I mean, I had, uh, you know, back in 2010, I um, I was on a certain path in my life, a certain professional path, and I got fed up with it and needed a change and had an opportunity to think about what I really wanted to do at the same time that my sister did. So we started thinking about what mattered to us and had this idea that you could do business for good as well as make money and that we'd like to create something new together. And food was a natural thing for us to go to and we started thinking about... Um, the products that we buy in the supermarket and what we're contributing to when we buy those products. Take me back to that moment when you were, were you, what, you sitting around the kitchen table and mm-hmm. how, did the, how did the idea come up? Well, it bubbled up over time because I had um, had a bit of an epiphany moment. I, I, uh, I was living out in Barcelona on an expat contract with a big company and I suddenly realised one day I wasn't very happy and I'd done all the things I should have done but it wasn't working anymore. And I um, started looking around for inspiration of what I could do next and got really inspired by Anita Roddick and Daniel Pink and some of the other stuff that was being written at the time and decided that that I wanted to create a business for good. At the same time that my sister decided she was fed up with her job, she was um, working with um, underprivileged kids and and quite mentally drained from that job Mm. and moving to Brighton and she um, started selling coffee on a market stall. So she looked around for a brand that she liked and found a brand in Manchester that was set up by a group of Ethiopian guys. Ethiopia delivers some of the best coffee beans in the world they make. Mm. So these guys had created a social enterprise, were importing coffee from a cooperative in Ethiopia where all their mates were and using the proceeds to send their kids to school here and build a life in Manchester. So we had our first introduction to a sort of a social enterprise, a business that was doing something other than just making money. So we started talking about coffee and uh, I think I coined the phrase, I just said, oh, that's just coffee how it should be. So, you know, you buy your coffee and most of the money goes to the people that grow it and um, isn't that how it should be? So we started thinking about what if you had, what if all the products were like that and what's out there at the moment, you know, what exists now and the coffee trade's very exploitative and when you start looking at it, you you get to see that and and that was the beginning of the conversations really. That was back in 2009 and and we moved to Brighton a year later to start the business. That's interesting because you're right, when when you buy a product in the supermarket, you have this kind of simple idea that, you know, the coffee beans I'm buying you know, some of that will go to the supermarket, some mm-hmm. of it to maybe the company with the name on the logo, but the rest would go to the farmer. Mm-hmm. But that's no. True. I mean, most supermarket. I mean, uh, when you spend a pound in in a big supermarket, you know, between nine and ten p goes to the supplier, 
and most of it wow. goes into advertising back to you or into into profits. Yeah. Uh, but when when you spend a pound in Hisby, um, sixty eight p goes to the supplier. So wow. it, when you do that, it changes everything because you're suddenly giving the suppliers what they need to create great food, and that's why foods become bad because the the quality of what the suppliers make have been degra- has been degraded over time. Um, and they've been squeezed more and more over time. So I suppose they've had to degrade the food to just make a profit. Exactly. Yeah. And then you get you know the proliferation of um, really cheap, badly made food. You know, highly processed food that's full of fat and sugar is brilliant for supermarkets because it's highly profitable, mm. and it's brilliant for suppliers of big brands because it's highly profitable. So that's what's on the shelves because that's what they want to sell us. Wow, it seems so simple the way you explain it. You think, oh, that's how this all came about. But when about. we started looking into it, we're like, oh, there's this and there's this. And this is a real problem. You know, you've got um, the degradation of the food. You've got exploitation of suppliers in this country and all over the world. You've got exploitation of animals in, you know, really horrendous factory farming um, conditions. Uh, you've got supermarkets squeezing small um Super, smaller shops out of towns and taking over town centres mm. and there's all of these sort of side effects of the way supermarkets do business mm. and we were like well it's just the way they do business they're really good at that that's what they do yeah. but maybe there's another way what intrigues me you know this is the entrepreneurial spark which I, I always love it's like for most people they would just say it. they'd be resentful of it and complain about it to their friends but you actually went out and did something about it yeah. So what do you think it was different for you that made you say, well, I'm actually going to take action? I think that I was, I was really lacking a sense of purpose. Mm-hmm. So I recognised, I was at a point in my life where I recognised I was working really hard because that's how I'd wired myself to work really hard and that something was lacking and it was a sense of meaning and purpose um, through, through work. And I was looking for that. So I looked to what I care about. And when you care about something, you follow it. So I just logic. I just followed what I cared about, and it's brought me here. I shot an arrow and just followed the arrow, and mm. the arrow was. I mean, at first we weren't going to necessarily open a supermarket. We were just going to create products that challenged the thinking, and it was about a year into our thinking that Amy said, "Oh shit, we need to open a supermarket." Then I went, "Oh right, yes, <laughs> we do. It's the only way it's going to shake things up." How did you feel in that moment when you had that? Revelation? Really scared. Yeah, yeah. it was I'd very daunting. Scared. Yeah. yeah. And it felt personal because we'd grown up, you know, on, we didn't have any money when we were growing up and we ate frozen fruit out of bee jams. I don't know, you know, you, people won't know bee jams, but it used to be before Iceland, you went to bee jams and it's all just, re- it's just frozen food. So we'd, we'd not grown up with um, much of a food culture or understanding of what food was. And the more we looked into it, the more important we realised it was to eat well. Mm. And that if the kids all ate well, um, then they could fulfill their potential and so all that is, stuff. is frozen food less nutritious than fresh food well a lot of the over processed stuff falls into that category so if you're eating fresh um, veggies and stuff that are frozen they're actually really fresh because they're generally frozen at, at the point of picking wow. but we weren't we were eating pizzas and chicken pies and stuff like that <laughs> and you know years later when I, I used to um, negotiate with Tesco and I'd be working I was working for a big uh, food and um, uh, non-food brands and uh, I would negotiate with supermarkets and I was waiting for my buyer one day um, in the lobby and he, he was late, he was always late, that's what they do, but he was really happy when he turned up and I was really surprised. I said, oh, what's happened? And he said, oh, um, I've just come out of a really inspiring meeting, Ruth. And I said, what? And he said, oh, we've just figured out how to save the company, the Tesco, millions of pounds. We found out that the chicken in the chicken pies is just too good. And... It turns out that the silly old farmer was using grade A chicken in the economy chicken pies. So they changed his whole supply chain and made him move to a lower grade chicken. The price of the customer stays the same. Um, He gets less money and Tesco makes more profit. And that's what I mean by engineering the goodness out of food. Because suddenly you've got a product that isn't great chicken and it's not real eggs and it's not real butter because it's cheaper to find alternatives Mm. and throughout the 90s there was category management projects in chicken pies and pizzas and all sorts of products and quiches to engineer those good things out of food because it made them cheaper and made them more profitable 
It's extraordinary the way that you know that people sat down and planned that. You yeah, know? it's like you can. I suppose the question that comes up that surely somebody in the room went, "Well, hold on, guys, is this a good idea?" They're doing their job. They're following their remit. It's like the guys who create, um, you know, the guys in the big chemical companies like Monsanto who create seeds that terminate themselves after a year. So after one season, the seed kills itself. That is an that's a feat of engineering because seeds by nature literally yeah. by nature, uh, give every year and go on and multiply and you get more seeds. But, you know, they've created a system where the, 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 the seed self-terminates and the buyer has, to, so the farmer has to buy them again. Oh, so they have repeat business yeah. constantly. So that's the, same, that's the same mindset. They're thinking business, they're not thinking food. And that's what oh, we're up against. Shocking, really, isn't it? It is normal. Yeah. Yeah, it's normal. So we're trying to shine a light on that and say there's another way. Great. Well, I'm glad there are people like you out there <laughs> doing that because, you know, uh, what's that lovely line that says that uh, history is written by unreasonable people? Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. So that's you're it. being unreasonable and saying, well, you know what, I think people should actually have good food and the farmers should keep some of the money. And, and, and progress relies on un, unreasonable people. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, we, but really our shop is, is championing all those unreasonable people because our shop is just a place where you go and you find all the brands doing great things. So um, we sort of bring all, bring them all together, everyone from the porridge lady to, uh, you know, the person who's making brownies to the people making real bread. They're all doing it how it should be, and we put it in one place and make it accessible to people. Mm. So they're the champion. We're championing the champions, um, the unreasonable people all over yeah. all, all through the industry. Yes. So what motivates you every day to keep going with this? Because I I can only imagine how tough it must be. Because the system is so against you in, in many ways. I'm motivated because I duck out the system. So um, I think there are two ways to create change. One's from inside the system. Yeah. Uh, or you step outside the system and you create something new. And you, you, you grow that and then it um, supersedes the old system. So that's what I, what I love is the idea of creating something new from scratch. And finding the people that want to help you do that. Um, so, yeah, I don't feel drained and pulled down by the old system because I'm creating a new way that's working. It reminds me of the Malcolm Gladwell book, uh, David and Goliath, where, ah, where right. he kind of points this out that actually all big systems are brought down by the little guy because they're more nimble, they're more flexible. Yeah. Um, and, of course, it, all systems are going to become... There's a saying that says it's too big to fail, but actually, in truth, it's too big to succeed. Because yeah. when they get really big, they become, as you say, people sitting there trying to figure exactly. out. Exactly. And I mean, it. Tesco started with one store. Yeah. You know, at stage we start, they all started with one store and that's what we're doing. But we will, you know, we will be yeah. a national chain. And, you know, retails like that, you know, you've always got retails, uh, brands tend to have a 30 to 40 year cycle. Yeah, and so they it's getting shorter, away. isn't it? So like I, you 20 know, years now. I yeah. Think. So I think in, you know, certainly in the next... 10 years I believe that we'll see one of the big supermarkets fail as a supermarket and turn into something else or get bought by the others because it's just they're all the same and they're oversaturated and they're all doing the same thing. Let's just imagine say five years from now yeah. you get that phone call from one of those big supermarkets saying yeah. we love what you're doing um, and we want to buy you. Oh. Well it depends who it is. Mm. Uh, I mean we wouldn't sell to Tesco or Sainsbury's or one of the big brands because of the antithesis of what we're doing and they wouldn't do it genuinely mm. but if it was a partnership with someone like m and s it could mm -hmm. be different okay. but i think that that's not that's not the route we see the route we see is rather that we replicate and are so copied by independent supermarkets and big supermarkets alike that the things that we do become normal so we want every mm. waitrose and every m and s to copy so you want them to copy things too, that we're yeah. doing <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they won't copy it genuinely and get it all perfect but if they start to copy some of the things we do and do it well, then it will change the food system. Mm. And if we open enough stores and we we also help in independence, we help people who want to set up their own stores or food brands, we coach and support them to do it. Oh, great. So the idea is to sort of proliferate the good practices in the food industry by helping the people that are also want to challenge the big supermarkets. So you're a kind of disruptor of like, here's a new model. Yeah. And then you're... you're, you're through propaganda you're spreading it to we're you know, the spread masses yeah to we're say. spreading it through other people mm. caring about what we do and i mean you know the core will be more something like um 
supermarket X Tesco is selling or pulling out of all of its stores in this region. Um, and the opportunity would then be for us to buy, it. To buy those stores yeah, yeah. and to move into those stores and get those premises going. So really we are getting our brand and our positioning and our everything we do right and our imp the impact that we have right ready for those moments when we have opportunities to expand. Wow. Well, great. Yes, I know. I wish you were on my street corner and I could just... Uh, one day. And, yeah, one day. <laughs> one day. Yeah, yeah. So when you think of the word successful, who's the first person who comes to mind? The first person that comes to mind actually is Anita Roddick. She's someone that represents to me someone who was completely true to themselves, who innovated and created something new, made no apology about her ambition and um, created something unique that still has an influence today and combined um, business and her passion. You know, she strongly believed that the values of love and, and, and ethics was not incompatible with the idea of doing business. So to me, she's successful because she did all that and she followed her own path. Uh, but then I, I, you know, she became a multi-millionaire So I, I don't just think that people who make the money are successful. I see, you know, my friends who are following their paths that um, they might not have the same ambition that I've got in business, but they have their family and they've created homes and they are uh, making everything fit around the values and the goals that they have. They're successful because they're true to themselves. So I suppose that's what success is to me, that you are true to what you want to do and you, you are creating yourself as you go through life and not just following something else that you think you should do. And of course, uh, Anita Roderick uh, formed the body shop here yeah. in Brighton. Yeah, exactly. Just, so yeah, and she's my hero. And um, you know, we we got to meet um, Gordon, her husband, um, and his right hand man Peter, and um, they became mentors to us. So that was full circle because Gordon actually gave us some money towards opening the first store, the pilot wow. store, yeah. and uh, was really uh, into what we were doing. So that was a that was a dream for us to meet him and and get to hear stories about Anita. And we also um, work with the brand team that did the early body shop work. They cut their teeth and did all, all their, their uh, the early work on the body shop, and now they're working with us. So yeah. that's that's cool. Wow. <laughs> Makes me very happy. <laughs> so it's quite, it's quite a lineage you're coming from, in a yeah. way, that spirit. That, it, when, uh... when things like that happen to you, you think, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing more powerful or dangerous in the world than an idea. You know, once that idea gets out, it changes things. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. very true. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, if you could only impact one piece of wisdom to the world, what would it be? It would be, don't live on autopilot. Mm. Interrupt that, because we're all living on autopilot as a product of the seeds that were sown when we were little and the things that happened to us when we were little until we interrupt it and mm. we see that there's another way. And what's a good way of interrupting it, do you think? Um, I think people are interrupted by being exposed to a new idea. So when you say how powerful ideas are, that's what comes mm. to mind. Someone imparts an idea to them that makes them think, oh, I'm on autopilot. And some people are interrupted by trauma. Something bad happens in their lives and it becomes um, unsupportable, it becomes untenable, and they have to do something to change in order to survive. Mm. So I think that that kind of interruption can happen out of something going wrong or being exposed to new ideas. I think it's interesting. I've been studying a lot about trauma over the years, and one of the things I'm really starting to understand about it is that what trauma is, is we all have a model of the world that we carry around in our heads. You know, this is how the world is. Mm -hmm. And trauma is when you get a huge interrupt in that of new information that comes rapidly in, in one yeah. moment and says, actually, the world isn't exactly how you thought. There's this whole other thing. And we call it trauma. Mm -hmm. And the reason that it is very difficult for us because the brain has to do a massive amount of rewiring. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I've got to take in this huge amount of new information. So trauma, you know, it's... We talk about PTSD and all of that, but actually a lot of it is just like, it's actually a natural part of developing. Mm -hmm. That we will have periods in our life when suddenly huge new bits of information come in. And it's really how we flow with it, whether we're able to ride that wave 
or you know we stumble and fall mm-hmm. and that's kind of where trauma becomes a problem yeah when you don't integrate it into you yeah yeah but also if it happens when you're young you can internalize it and it can end up um becoming neurological and you you get yes. wired for trauma and then you become sort of preoccupied with survival rather than well, anything again, else and yeah. that's it's that. how it's how it's processed so again yeah. with, with with children you're right that children need an adult to help them process it because they can't it's too much information and if so if they've got a sympathetic adult who's able to say oh yeah that was scary or that mm-hmm. was you know whatever and the child's able to go make sense of it then they can integrate it which is why you can have you know several people who went through the same difficult experience and mm-hmm. some are fine with it mm-hmm. but others aren't mm. and that's what they're starting to understand about trauma yeah. it's just how how what opportunities we have to process it mm-hmm. you know which as children we need we need good adults around us yeah and some people have that and unfortunately lots of people don't yeah so what do you think is your top entrepreneurial skill then that's allowed you to i mean it's what 10 years you've been on this journey of mm. creating this supermarket I'm wondering if you've got familiar, like there's a, there's a, a skill set that you're using each time. I think the one is just sheer resilience. Resilience. I won't stop. You yeah. know, I have a vision to transform the food industry and I will just always pursue that. And I think that resilience and persistence seems to be a big hallmark of ultimate success and where you want to get to. So I do it every day, um, Mm -hmm. and I don't stop when things go wrong. Um, I'm also, I'm able to imagine, I'm able to imagine a better way, and I realise that a lot of people aren't. So a lot of, there's sort of how it is, and how it should be, or how it could be. A lot of people get so caught up in how it is, they can't imagine it being any other way. But things are only that way. They're not, I mean, supermarkets aren't how they are, because some immutable law of the universe made them that way. They're just... Tesco said we're going to do it like this mm. and then people keep it that way so I don't have I don't have a problem imagining that whole system being replaced by something else mm. but other people really do have a problem imagining yeah. new things happening and I think that's probably one of my biggest assets that I can not just imagine those happening but I expect it to happen that's interesting isn't it? because you know, the only constant in life really is change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but we all resist change. Yeah. Because it again, it requires us to re- rewire some parts of our brain. Yeah. And that takes a lot of effort. Well, uh, yeah. yeah, I love change. And my sister loves yeah. change. So yeah, yeah. we embrace it, welcome it and see where it takes us. We yeah. don't fight it. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that is probably a characteristic that makes us a little bit different. Mm. Um, and um, we have no trouble imagining big things happening. Well, yeah. you know, they, they say the, the number one uh, drive of the universe is entropy, which is basically decay. You know, it's yeah. like every, we, we as a species work very, very hard to try and prevent decay. Yeah. But it will, it will happen. I mean, yeah. I'm just noticing True. walking up my street today, it's like how all these weeds were growing out of the pavement. I thought, you just can't stop nature. It was like, even yeah. though this is concrete, it's found a tiny, tiny little crack and it's managed to... Very true, isn't it? Right, so, you know, a few hundred years down the line, all this will be covered in yeah. greenery. Because I mean, we're decaying right now. The oxygen sure that we're breathing in our bodies is <laughs> decaying one, ourselves as well as feeding them. During this interview, you have decayed <laughs> by at least half an hour. Yeah, but I'll <laughs> need a pint. I'll need a pint later. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, what is something you believe that other people think is insane? Oh my God, how deep do we want to go? Let's <laughs> go as deep as you want to go. Um, I, uh, something I believe that other people are insane. I believe that we are just vessels for ideas. So I believe that the idea of his beer is out there in the ether, channeling itself through me and my sister. Wow. I think that we are receptors for things that go on and that it's already created and we're the vessel for the creation. I think we're vessels of creation. So that's something that a lot of people think is insane that I passionately... So the, the idea has a life yeah. outside of you. The idea is formed yeah. and looking for the right yeah. vessel. Yeah, yeah. And we're, the things that have happened to us and the road that we've taken and the ridiculous amounts of coincidences and think like meeting Gordon Roddick, like, you know, working with uh, the brand team that 
worked on the body shop. So many things point to that. And moments of grace and moments of inspiration is the entry point for ideas. Moments of grace and moments and of inspiration. inspiration. Yeah. So yeah. when ideas come, where do they come from? I think uh, they come from this... I think they're using us as vessels. Reminds me of that quote by Goethe, which says, you know... Um, once you commit to something, providence delivers opportunities which would not otherwise have arisen. And I think it's that, isn't it? Once you, this is the, t- the hardest thing of being an entrepreneur, is committing to the idea. Yeah. Especially when you have no resources, no, no feedback at all whether the idea is any good. Yeah. And you have to, as you say, be persistent with it, commit to it, yeah. and just keep going with it. And be prepared for it to change you. So if I'm mm. going to set out a vision that I'm going to create a business and a brand that transforms the food industry over 30 years. That's a massive vision. Mm. I can't expect that I'm prepared and able and ready to do that. So if I'm shooting that arrow, the world is going to have to shape for me to be ready when I get there. So I'm going to have to shed old behaviours, old beliefs, old thoughts and old wiring. That means I can't meet that vision. And I've changed so much over the last 10 years, and so has Amy and Jack, our other um, director. We've all changed in service of a vision. So what came first? Mm. The vision requires us to be the vessels that it needs us to be to make it happen. And also that, that almost makes it worthwhile. Yeah, you know, it's like, exactly. You, it's a journey. Say, yeah, the, it, I know it's an overused term that you know we go on a journey, but it does yeah. the act of creating something changes you as well. So that's why it's exactly. worth doing it. Even if, you know, like that saying, you know, write a book. It doesn't matter if nobody else reads it. It yeah. will change you just for the fact you, you wrote exactly. a book. Exactly. It's yeah. just for the sheer bloody buzz of it. You know, what else am I going to do? <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> I, you know, I want to, when I'm on my deathbed, yeah. I want several things to be happening. But one of the things I want to be happening is go is to be to go, I gave it a really good go. And whether we've got 10 shops or 5,000, yeah. I've followed a path and a vision and I saw where it took me. Yes, I mean, that thing of, they say that on people's deathbeds, the thing that they regret most is not what they did that failed, but yeah. what they didn't do. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. It's sort of tied up in that idea that just committing my life to something, you know, that's what I'm interested in. Yes, I mean, I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson, the, the kind of Canadian psychologist, who I know is very controversial in some circles, but he's written this book, The Twelve Rules of Life, and one of the rules is... You want to find meaning in your life, lift a heavy weight. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. do something difficult. Yeah. Because, you know, ironically, that gives you a sense of purpose and meaning. Absolutely. If you, if you want a hard life, take the easy route. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. it is actually quite painful taking yeah. the easy route all the time. And it's fascinating. I mean, that's, this is what separates us from dogs, cats, cows, animals, is that we can create our lives. We can create a life with meaning if we choose to. Mm. And I think that's the meaning of life. It's like, if you can create anything why wouldn't you pick something however big or small whether it's it might be converting your village green into a sports field you know it might it could be if you can create anything and that's what separates us from just being animals so i agree i mean i i think that one of the things that we have is this ability to turn failure into success Mm -hmm. and I'm just curious with, with that in your own life, like how, how, how has failure been for you in your life? You know, how have you learned from failure? Yeah, it's an important one. I think failure is part of the journey and, and the transformation. So, I mean, you know, several years ago, we had our hearts set on a second shop in St. James's Street and it all went horribly wrong over a period of nine or ten months. Mm. And um, the sense of failure for that falling through, we couldn't convince the landlord to take us on. Um, despite raising money and proving the model works and other things, he basically wanted to wait for a Starbucks. He wanted to wait for a big brand to come along, which is what happened. And now I go past there on the bus and it's a bloody Starbucks. Yeah. But <laughs> the, the, the sense of losing that store, when we got that call to say, no, this is definitely not happening, you're not getting this. We were so sure that we were, because mm. that's how we are, mm. that the, 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 the sense of failure was quite crushing. And it was followed by several tough decisions. So as a result... We'd, you know, we'd, we were overstretched financially and we had to, um, you know, the four of us who work in the central team had to go back on the shop floor and do shifts again. Um, and that was quite, you know, having 
worked so hard to get off the shop floor and work on expansion, that was really tough. Mm. So the shop fell through, the money was really tight, we had to go back to investors and explain it had all gone wrong. Um, and we ended up going, what felt like going back to the beginning, but of course it wasn't back to the beginning because we'd learned all these lessons about how to do it differently next time. And um, I now realise that if we had got that particular second store, it wouldn't have worked. We weren't actually ready. <laughs> but I, don't, I only know that now. There's a, there's a lovely quote by Mel Gibson. He says, um, you know, certain lessons in life you've got to pay to learn. It's, think of it as school fees. You, you know, it's like yeah. you, have to, you have to pay just to learn that particular lesson. Some yeah. are more expensive than others, but, but that is how we all learn, you know. Exactly. Yeah, wow. So what topic would you speak about if you were asked to give a TED talk on something outside of your main area of expertise? Ooh. So what's your passion outside of work? Health and growth. Mm. Personal growth. I don't feel qualified to give a talk on it. I could only share my stories on it and what's come mm. to me personally. Whereas I do feel qualified to talk about the, the world of supermarkets and transforming the food industry. But yeah, I'm slowly learning more about uh, what it means to be human and um, health and growth. That, to me, is fascinating. I don't know if I could explain it in a fascinating way to anyone else, though. But, well, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting what you said, that things like, I'm not qualified. And it's like we have that in our culture. It's like, well, if someone has a PhD or a degree yeah. or a master's in a subject, they obviously know it. Whereas people who've just you know lived life and learned along the way would say they're not qualified, which yeah. is quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah. But it's an interesting question. Can you teach you know how to create a business from nothing? You can go and do an MBA and learn mm -hmm. all of this stuff, but but um, the people I know that are very successful haven't done all of, of that academic training. Yeah. They've just gone and done it. Yeah. And they and learned, you know, learned in the field, basically, on the shop floor. Yeah. Um, which I'm a bigger fan of, I think. So what is the best or most worthwhile investment of money or time that you've ever made? Going on holiday and switching off, actually, because I take on too much and I juggle a lot and my brain gets full and then I can't live properly. Hmm. So my best use of money has actually been investing in my, in time for me. Mm. Time is more precious than anything, isn't it? <laughs> so you recover time when you spend it wisely. Yes, it's one of the few things that money can't buy you Yeah. in some ways. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I find to slow down and um, stop and invest in time and recuperation has been my best use of money. So if you had a gigantic billboard that someone mm -hmm. gave you that everybody was going to pass by today yeah. and you could put any message you liked on it, what would you put on it? Well, it's, this is where I risk sounding like, a, you know, cheesy memes on Facebook, but, you know, choose to be happy. Happiness is a choice and something that would make people interrupt their own thinking and realise that it's just stories in their head. Mm. Um, uh, there, there's to thine own self be true, which is a that old quote Shakespeare thing. That's important to me. Um, I can't think of anything clever. <laughs> Shakespeare's pretty clever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I like that you quote Shakespeare and you think, oh, I can't think of anything clever. clever. <laughs> if only it was Greek or Latin or something. <laughs> So here's a question I always love, which is, um, what advice would you give your 25-year-old self? I would say it's all going to be okay. It's all going to be okay. And um, everything that you're doing is enough. Because for a long, long time, I didn't think that I was enough. Mm. I could ever do enough. I could ever be enough. I could ever... That nothing was enough. And every, it is enough just to be who mm. be on this planet and be being. Um, so yeah, I'd say hang on in there, keep going, and you are enough. Mm. I like that, you are enough. Yeah. What have you changed your mind about in the last few years, and why? I've changed my mind. These aren't work things. 
That's all right. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, so the first thing that comes to my mind is addiction. I have come to understand the nature of addiction, depression, anxiety, and other things that people suffer from in a different way. Um, because I've been looking at the impact and effect of childhood circumstances and childhood trauma on people's development. And I've come to understand that these things are symptoms rather than, they're symptoms of things, things that happen. So my perception of other people has changed quite a lot. My perception of people in suffering has changed quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think my compassion has grown as a result. But yeah, my, yeah, quite narrow views on the suffering of some people has changed a lot. Yeah, it's interesting because we do, we tend to criminalise addiction. Yeah. You know, without looking at where it comes from. Yeah. And uh, actually I saw a post, I think, on Facebook from, oh, what's his name? The comedian. Russell Brand? Russell Brand. Yeah, I like his stuff, yeah. And he posted a, he says a, a, lot of stuff, yeah. a very interesting little cartoon of basically you know, them blaming the drugs and what have you for the person's criminality and said, but never mentioning the trauma and, yeah. you know, the poor parenting and all the things that will actually have led them to that place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's compuls compulsive behaviour of any kind is a symptom rather than something that someone's just choosing to do because they're yeah. being naughty. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, yeah, I think that that's what I changed my mind about the most over the last few years is that people going through that kind of thing. Great. Well, thank you very much for today. And, Welcome. Um, I hope everybody goes and checks out his bee, yep. uh, how it should be. And uh, hopefully one day there will be one in your local area. That would be great. That'd be amazing. Yeah, then we know it'll have worked. Uh, great, yeah. okay. Today's show was brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering you, dear listener, a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash midlife. The link is in the show notes so you can get started listening today to an audiobook that will help you turn your entrepreneurial ideas into reality. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Midlife Entrepreneurs Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do subscribe to my podcast and leave a review as it helps other people discover the podcast and helps me to keep doing this work. So until the next time, stay inspired about your vision, take action and bring your vision to the world. <laughs>